Hello and welcome to our first virtual Gower Society Youth Activity. Today we're going to go on a spring stroll around my garden. Now if you look at the Nature Days blog, you should be able to download a spotter sheet you can use with this video so you can see what the names of all the plants are. Or if you miss anything, if you look on my YouTube channel, it's hashtag Nature Days, you'll be able to find a whole complete version of this with pictures and all the names of all the plants. Now after today, I hope you go into your garden, go for a spring stroll around there, see if you can identify any of the plants there, see if you've got similar ones to me. Now we're going to start by looking at the spring trees, the trees that are out in, out in spring, and then we're going to go and look at the plants, the flowers really. So we're going to start over here. Move it on. This is our first tree that usually comes into blossom at this time of year in spring. Now if you look very carefully, can you see that? Lovely little delicate flowers here. Now these are five little petals and they're very similar to another tree that comes into blossom in springtime. But this is the first one to come in, in to blossom and this is the blackthorn. And it's very easy to distinguish it when the leaves are out, but in the winter time when there's no leaves, and also this time of year, it gets confused with another plant, which we'll have a look at. But if you look up at the stems, if you look over here and have a look at these, look at these thorns. Wow, impressive, aren't they? So these thorns are about two and a half centimetres long, really long, and they are really quite spiky. And that makes this a blackthorn because they are so big. Also, the bark is a kind of blackish colour and it's quite dull. There's no shininess to it. And that's another distinguishing feature. But if you come back and look at these along the so these flower buds and the leaf buds that are coming out are along the branches. Oh, is that too close? However, when we look at the other one you can um, get it confused with, it looks very different. But have a look at this flower. So we've got rounded white petals here and we've got our anther sticking up. Now the leaves aren't out yet on this one, but I'm going to show you what the leaves are like when we go over to one of these that's actually in leaf. So if we come over here, follow me. Okay, so this is another black form. And this one has gone past the flowering stage or the blossom stage and the leaves are out. And if you have a look at the leaves, basically they are leaf shaped. We call them pilgrimage, um, but leaves sometimes have a big variety of shapes, but this is a very obvious, what we call a leaf shape. So we are going to now move on to the tree that it could be confused with, which is the hawthorn. And hopefully you'll be able to identify how it's different, especially this time of year. So my hawthorn's right at the top of my drive. So follow me up here. Have a look at all the trees in that a bit later. So this is our hawthorn. Now in the winter time, if you look up at the top here, this is your classic hawthorn, but it's quite similar to the blackthorn but the thorns are a bit smaller, just as sharp, but about one centimetre long. It's also much shinier. You can see the shiny bark here. And if it's a proper tree, this is more like a very young sapling, these twigs can actually grow in quite a gnarled way. They're not very straight. This one's quite straight at the moment. But the most important thing is, can you see any blossom? No, that's because in the hawthorn, the leaves come out first, but in the blackthorn, the blossom comes out first. And even the blossom, when it comes out in the hawthorn, it looks very similar to the blackthorn. But the, the same thing, five flowers, five little petals round together, white with the yellow anther, but they're not as pointy, uh, they're not as rounded, they're more pointy. If you look on my YouTube video, you'll see a picture so you can compare the two. But let's have a look at where these buds are for the leaves. So the leaves, unlike the blackthorn, and not anywhere along the branches apart from the berries that come later and the flowers in fact or the hawthorn you can actually eat these so when the little buds come out and also the flowers you can pick these little leaves and you can eat them and that literally tastes a bit like a little salad there's nothing much to them but they're very nice and tasty if you add them to something 
biggest distinguishing feature later on in the year, of course, is the fruit. Now the fruit of the hawthorn is called haws, and they're little red berries, bright red, and they come down and they hang down in little um, chandeliers type things. Now those you can eat, but you do need to cook them. You can make some nice jelly out of them. It's really nice and pink and tastes a bit floral. If you look at the blackthorn in autumn time, you get those sloes, which are bluey black, about that size, look a bit like small grapes, a bit rounder than grapes. You can eat those, but you have a bit of a shock when you do, because they dry your mouth out and they taste a bit, ooh. And so you can make them into jelly as well, so, or a nice slow pudding. But both of them are our first spring trees that we've looked at today. So do you think you could distinguish them? I hope you can. Next one we're gonna look at, not, don't tend to find in the same environment as the hawthorn. This is an older tree, that's A-L-D-E-R. Now, older trees are usually found in very wet areas. And in the winter months, the buds that come out of it are quite red, ready purpley. But of course, the leaves have come out now, so you can't see that ready bud um, color now. But if we look at the shape of the leaves, we've got this very rounded leaf here. It's a little bit serrated, the important thing to note is the fact that it's rounded all the way around. There's nothing sticking out at the bottom of the midrib here. So we've got our round leaf. And then if we look at the bark, we've got an awful lot of these dots. It looks like it's got measles. And these are lenticels. And this is a really good distinguishing feature as well. Hello, Helen. Hello, Kath. Hope Jacob's all right. And, and um, Darius. Right, we're going to look at another one that you might actually get muddled up with the older because there's more of it but the reason you might be able to see it's different is because of its location so this have a look at the leaf looks a bit like our older but have a look at the tip this is our distinguishing feature here we've got a point at the top so again pretty rounded bit of serration but we've got our tip there pointing out so this is our hawthorn, uh, hawthorn no, you should know that by now, that's a Christmas tree. So this is our hazel tree. So this hazel tree here, in the winter time, in about February, we could have seen the catkins, which were the flowers, so we don't get any blossoms. So no beautiful flowers like the blackthorn or the hawthorn, because it's not pollinated by the bees or any other pollinators. It's wind pollinated, so you've got those weird hanging down catkins that got blown by the wind. So this is our hazel here, point there so it's not an older. And the amazing thing about hazel is how to identify in the winter because it's got very distinct stems. So it is a tree, but I'm just gonna show you what I've done to my hedge. So if you come down to the bottom of my hedge, down here, this is one hazel tree. This should be a trunk. But what I've done is I've cut it and I've laid it down. And you see the horizontal branches here? So what happens is when you lay a, a, a hedge, you cut through most of the tree trunk and then you lay it down, but it's still connected by the growing cambium layer, the outside of the tree. And so it continues to grow horizontally. But then if you look up, you start to get side branches that start growing upwards and those turn into new, really thick growth. And hazel is great at growing really straight stems. So we see these stems here going straight up and all these really straight ones with a lovely brown, not quite so many lenticels as the older, but you can see they're really straight. So they're used for making hurdles, for basket weaving, for making fence posts. So this straight mode of um, growing is really useful for what it's actually made, uh, um, made for. So that's our hazel and of course later on in the year we get our hazelnuts. So I'm going to show you another tree down here, which is actually in mingled along here. It's this one here, but I've got a better version down here because I've got one that's in flower. So come down to the bottom. Okay, so this is a willow. Loads of different types of willow. So this is the willow that I've got here. And this is the female plant. So some trees can have their male and female on two different individuals. Some of them can have it on the same individual. So this one's on two different individuals. So we say it's dioecious. If it was on the same individual, there'd be monoecious. So this dioecious tree 
has got a male tree and a female tree. And this is the female tree. The, the male tree was the one that we saw up there and you wouldn't see any of these on it, these flowers. So that female tree there, here has still got its flowers on it because this is what's gonna create the seed. The male flower has a tiny little catkin that had some pollen that got blown over to here. So if you can see closely up onto this catkin here, at the end of these tiny little shoots, this is what we call the stigma, so that's sticky. So the pollen gets blown by the wind, lands on the sticky stigma, and then a pollen tube grows down this stalk bit here, and at the bottom of each of these stalks, there is an ovum, which is the egg, the female part of the, of the seed, and then outside it is the ovary. When the pollen goes to the ovary, then they fuse and they turn into the seed. Now, if you come back here in probably a couple of weeks, what will happen is inside there, although you won't see anything, there'll be a tiny seed developing and along the tube, there'll be a tiny parachute. And this will burst open and then the parachute will be caught by the wind and they'll start to blow away. Now, if on your daily walk or in your garden, you've got a willow woodland or a willow hedge with lots of willow, in a few weeks time, if you look along the floor, you'll find a whole heap of these um, parachutes and their seeds. It almost looks like it's snowing if you've got lots of um, willow trees. And these pacatkins, once they've um, distributed their seeds, they'll just fall off because that's they've done their job. So it's very interesting to see the different trees with the different types of flowers, depending on whether it needs a pollinator, so they're beautiful and they might smell, or if they're wind pollinated and then they're very dull because the wind doesn't matter what colour they are but they also usually stick out more so the wind can actually pass by them. So this is our willow, very flexible plant as well so it's great for making branches and of course the bark contains salicylic acid which is what they use for making aspirin. Right, so that's all the trees I'm going to tell you about. What we're going to look at now is the actual spring flowers. And we're going to start with the first one. So if you come down here, so we've got to go down because we're going underneath the canopy of the wood. So if you've got lots of plants which are spring flowers, which are naturally growing in your garden, it probably means that your garden was once a woodland or there are lots of trees there now. Because a woodland structure is built in a way so that the different plants have a different time to grow. So we've got our hawthorn, which has got the flowers coming out after the blackthorn. We've got our willow, where the flowers are coming out now. So they're coming out all at different times, and the leaves will also emerge at different times, so they each get a chance to get hold of the sunlight, so they're not out competing each other. But the spring flowers, they've got a really good idea. So if we just look, if you can just look up from where these spring flowers are, just have a look up there. You can see quite a bit of sky, can't you? which means you can see quite a bit of sun. Now imagine if every single one of those branches of those twigs had opened up its leaves and it would be very hard to see the sun and you'd have much less cover, uh, much more cover. You'd have much less sunlight, much less energy, so you wouldn't be able to photosynthesize or grow. So this flower here, the spring flower, is growing at this time of year when the light can come down because the, the um, trees haven't gone into leaf yet. As soon as the leaf colour or the cover or the canopy has grown over, these will die because they won't get enough light. So they're all taking it in turns to use the light as and when it's available to them. This one here, this is in the buttercup family, the ranunculus, and the buttercup family has got lots of different types, uh, different species within it. And this one is the first one that usually comes out. This is called lesser celandine. And lesser celandine is very easy to distinguish from the other buttercups because what's that say? Um, you've got the leaves are not overlapping. They're quite thin. That's, that's the petals, sorry. So these petals here, you can see there's a gap in between them. Whereas you think about your normal buttercups, it's as if you've got that and you squeeze it together and they overlap. So that's your creeping or your meadow buttercup. So this lesser celandine, another really good identifying feature is its leaves. So it's leaves, ignore the, the animal mark, but they're pretty much heart-shaped and they usually have these slight discolorations. You can see they are here. So beautiful flower, really nice one to draw if you want to draw some spring flowers and always found at the bottom underneath the canopy and these will grow 
from maybe February if you're lucky and then in the next few months you can see they're all getting a bit ragged now they're going to die off and then they'll spend the rest of the winter underneath the ground in bulbs until next spring when the leaves have disappeared again and then they'll grow out again. So that's our first spring plant, our lesser celentine, our first spring flower. Next we're going to go to another one down here, one of my favourites. Now I know this is Elliot's favourite as well, I don't know if he's watching. So this, Elliot will tell you, is an arum. Now I'm lucky to have this in my garden because I think it's a beautiful flower. So the arum family has got lots of different ones. So this is the one we have in this country in our woodlands. And this is called Lords and Ladies. So this is the lady and it's meant to look a bit like an Edwardian lady like Queen Victoria with this ruff around her. And we've got here our stigma, our style. And this is how we're going to create our seeds of the future for this arum. Now arum, can you see, is it brightly coloured? Do you think if you were a pollinator, you'd see that and go, oh yeah, compare it to the lesser celandine. Really not that bright, pretty similar colours between it and the flowers. So it gets you thinking about what pollinator is going to be attracted by that. It's quite easy to miss. And the reason it's this colour is because it's not attracting a pollinator that would like to see a bright colour. This is actually using smell to actually attract it. So it smells, if you ever smell it, it doesn't smell very nice. It's meant to smell like cat wee. So it smells like that because it's attracting flies. And the flies, there's one right there, come in here and they try and find something nice to eat down here. And as they come down, they will bypass this and they might rub against the stigma and they'll end up pollinating it by going from one plant to the other. Once we get our pollen going on to the stigma, we get our pollen tube being created just like we did on the willow, same process. And then down here, we've got the ovary with the ovums in there. So we've got some seeds, the female part of the seeds in there. When the pollen grain attaches to those, these will grow into seeds, but outside it, unlike the willow, this will start to grow our, um, some berries as well. So bright red berries will start to form around the seeds. And the point of that is so that some animal comes along and eats it and the seeds go all the way through it. The outside, the berry bit gets digested, but the seed bit gets pooped out the other end with a nice pile of poo, which is a nice bit of food for the seed to grow with. And then it will grow into a lovely new plant, a new arum, far away from its parents. A bit like the willow, Anything that's got parents, any new um, seedling doesn't want to be growing in the same place because they'll be fighting for the same things. They'll be fighting for light, fighting for resources, soil and everything. So they want to be transported away. So the seeds of the willow are transported by the wind and the seeds of things like arum and the thaw hawthorn or the blackthorn are transported by animals eating their seed it's inside the berries and then pooping them out somewhere else. Now, this plant here, especially the berries of that, that lord part of the lords and ladies, are highly poisonous. So you mustn't eat them. Now hopefully you know that now and you won't go near them because they're very close to the ground and it's a great place to find berries really close to the ground. Not many plants do that. However, you can also eat it by accident. So if you look at these leaves, very distinct leaves, look like an arrow but sometimes they're found within a very big patch of wild garlic. Now, wild garlic doesn't look like this. And if you were to, to put them side by side, unfortunately, I haven't got any wild garlic in my garden, so I can't show you. But if you were to put them side by side, you would be able to identify them. But if you had a whole patch of wild garlic here and you were picking them by just putting your hand down and pulling, you might end up having a mix of these leaves. So if you do that, make sure you check each leaf before you actually cook it or eat it. So first of all, you'll see that this is an arrow and your uh, wild garlic are more like a sword shaped, so no arrow head. Also, you've got this vein going around the outside and wild garlic doesn't have that vein. But the best thing is wild garlic, of course, smells like garlic and this one doesn't smell the leaves itself. So make sure you check them because you don't want to be eating anything that's poisonous. But if you watch these flowers as they're coming up, this is a beautiful one here. Look, this is it 
before it's unfurled. So if you take photos of it going through the different stages, you can make a really good flip book. Do you do flip books anymore? So you can take a photo of this, come back the next day, take another photo, take another photo until it's opened up, and then put them together, staple them together, flick through them, and then you can see the different stages of the flower opening up. And it goes for any flower, really, but these look particularly nice. Right, let's go and see another classic flower down this way. Okay, probably all recognise this one. Very classic spring flower. However, a great thing to do if you've got these in your garden is to find out if we've got the native or the Spanish or a hybrid. So this, of course, is a bluebell. Not blue at all. Ridiculous name. Never mind. So this bluebell here, we need to find out if it's a native or a Spanish. We really would like it to be native because it's always better to have native plants in the country where they belong. The way we tell it's a native and not Spanish is a few different ways. First of all, we start with our leaves. So these are the leaves of our um, bluebell, very long. Okay, so even if it's among something else, you should be able to tell it from something like the lesser celandine. So long leaves here, and we want to know how thick they are. So I'm going to use just a 2p, and if we look, probably less than half the size of our 2p. That makes you think that this is a native. If they were wider, and probably as wide as my 2p, then they're going to be a Spanish. And I do have one, but it's way outside of my house, so I won't show you that. But have a look at your garden. So that's the first way we can look and see if they're actually a native. The next thing is, is their form. Have a look at the bell itself. Can you see at the end of the bell, the petals are actually going back on themselves. So they're actually going all the way back. That is another distinguishing feature of it being a native. If they were a Spanish, they'd be more splaying out. So if this was it, you'd be having them coming out like this, straight out, not folding back on themselves, not curling back. So that's another feature for it being a native. Next thing is the anther, so the male part of the flowers. Now, in the native version, we have an anther which is creamy coloured. And in a um, Spanish version, they're the same colour as the bell itself, so they're purpley uh, blue. So if we have a look at the anther here, what do we have? We have cream ones. So again, makes us think that it's a native. One more thing, if you look at the way it's growing, can you see that it's asymmetrical? So most of the flowers are on one side of the stalk. With Spanish ones, they're much more symmetrical. You've got them coming out both sides of the stalk. So they tend to stand more upright. Whereas with these native ones, they tend to bend over because they're a bit top heavy. So they go push down on one side. And then the last thing is the native ones smell and the Spanish ones don't. So I'm just going to give it a quick whiff. Can't smell a thing, but never mind. That's not bad. There's about four out of five that we got right. So I reckon that that's a native bluebell. Okay, right. Let's go and have a look at some ferns now. Where are the ferns? Up this way. Now, when I looked at these yesterday, they looked completely different. It's very, it's amazing how quickly they've changed. So I don't know if you can see this one down the bottom here. This tiny one. Can you see this one? So this here, we call this a fiddlehead because it looks like the end of a violin. So this fiddlehead here is the first, the first sprouting part of our fern. Now this fern here is probably a shield fern, not very good on ferns, but it's definitely not a bracken. Brackens are found individually. So if you have a look around here, we've got them coming out one at a time. So these are probably bracken, and this is a fern because it's coming from a central place in a ring. Now these fiddleheads you can actually eat. You've got to be a bit careful because the bracken one's not quite so nice to eat, and you've got to know which one it is. The best one is to eat is the actual ostr um, ostrich fern, which I haven't got here, and I don't think we've got much in this country anyway, more about in America. But these fiddleheads here, again, a bit like when I said about filming the arum as it opened. If you want to film these, they look amazing. You've probably seen sped up footage on wildlife shows. So you can see it's curled right up there, like a, a, um, a snail shell. 
and slowly that will unfurl and unfurl until you just the ends are curled up and then it will open up perfectly and you'll get this form. Beautiful system and it just looks amazing when you film it. Now the other thing about these ferns, fantastic for looking at maths and what we've got here is a fractal. Now a fractal is a repeating pattern so if you look with a magnifying glass really closely at these tiny little fronds, you'll see a pattern along the edges. And then that pattern is repeated again to make these little um, leaflets. And then again, it's repeated to make the whole leaf. And it's a stunning picture if you want to make a drawing of it, or even if you pick a bit of it and you can make, if you've got sun paper, it makes amazing pictures on sun paper. Or if you get some dye, you can make dye out of onion skins. You can dye and put this on an egg and then dye the egg. The bit that's got this on it won't get dyed and you get that beautiful pattern stuck on it. You could probably use that dye on anything that's, that's not too um, flimsy like paper. But these stunning ferns are going to be creating a lovely structure, an understory for our woodland. And these will last much longer than our spring flowers because these are adapted to live in conditions of low light. They, they are a different colour green, so their chlorophyll, the stuff that sucks up the, the sun and the energy, is going to be, doesn't mind it in the shade. So any shady part, you get some food and they can survive. Right. We're going to now go to a different kind of habitat. So all the ones we've looked at so far are in our woodland habitat. I think I've done all the ones in here. Yeah, we're going to go now into grassland habitat. So we're going to go around my house onto my lawn. Now hopefully you've all got a bit of grass. Now the grass itself, I don't look after my grass, which is really good for wildlife and it means you get a nice variety of biodiversity, a nice um, diversity of plants. So we're going to have a look at my grass and see what plants we've got there. Okay, so this one here this is in the family of the umberfillers. So the umberfillers have flowers a bit later on, this, this will flower, late spring, early summer, and they create a flowering head, which has got lots of tiny little flowers making the shape of an umbrella. Now you've got to be a bit careful with the umberfillers because some of them are really not very nice. But this one here, I know what this one is, so I know it's okay to touch. There is one called the giant hogweed, which looks very similar to this, slightly more pointed leaves, but it's got this kind of three leaflets form. And they grow very tall. They could be taller than my head. They could be six, ten foot tall. But those leaves and those branches, if you break it and you get the sap on your skin and get exposed to the sunlight, you can get blisters. So do be very careful. This one, if I have a look at this branch here, this is Alexander's. And if you peel back this furry top, this furry outside, you can eat the inside and it's meant to be a bit like celery. But as I said, it can look very much like a, another plant at this age, at this stage. If you've got one a bit like this, but the leaf has turned into lots of little leaflets, a bit like our fern, then you might have something called water dropwort, which again is not a nice plant, it's quite a poisonous one and can give you some nasty blisters. You also might have hemlock, which is deadly poisonous. So I usually stay away from these um, amberfillers because it is very difficult until they're in flower to make a very positive identification. So there's a really important lesson there. If you're not 100% sure what the plant is, then you do not eat it. And sometimes you don't even want to touch it. But if you make sure you wash your hands, usually you're okay. Right, we're gonna follow Around the corner here to another grassland plant. Okay, so this one here, this is really cool. This is the largest one we've got in our garden. Oh, I'm sticking, sticking on the stick, sitting on the stick. So this is a huge one, and this is one of my favourite plants. This is burdock, and it's a bit furry but not very furry. If you've got ones growing in your garden and they're coming out from a central point like these ones are here, but they are very furry, then they're coming out now, then they're foxglove. And foxglove makes really good toilet paper. So in case you do run out, 
keep an eye out of where they're growing. And they'll grow up later into some beautiful flowers with, t with these big, like imagine if you made a glove just for your fingers. That's what the fox glove looks like. Lovely pink, purple, sometimes even blue. Look a bit like a very long extended bluebell. And those have got brilliant pollinators. Again, summer flower, not a spring flower. So if we're still here in the summer, maybe we'll find some of those. But back to this one. This one's got a lovely white, slightly furry bottom and a huge big leaf. And this is called burdock. And burdock, the best thing about burdock is that you can eat it. So if we look at the bottom here, find your central plant and you're gonna try and find the tap root. However, you must make sure that this is the first year of growth. If you have a look over here, I've got some stems. Now this is from the same plant, this is the burdock stem from last year. And if it's got stems like this, it means that it's actually grown its burrs. And we've got some burrs here. There we go. So these are burrs, these are the seeds of the burdock. And this is how they invented Velcro, and yet they stick to you probably played with them in the woods and they go the seeds come out when you pull them off what would be your fur if you're an animal so this is how they distribute their seeds to move them around those seeds will now turn into new plants but if you've had your first year of growth and you've had your burrs growing all the energy that's stored in the root of the burdock has been used to create seeds so we can dig down and pull up the plant and you'll find no big tap root However, first year growth, which is what this is, because it hasn't got a big stem, if you dig down with a, with a spade and pull up the stem, don't pull it until you've got a really good view of it, So if you pull it, it will snap. And then you'll find quite a thin, but a really nice, like a parsnip root. Then if you either um, scrape it, wash it, or if you um, just scrub it, you can then fry it up and you can have it. And it's a beautiful tasting one, a bit like parsnip. Hello, we've got Eve there. Hello, Eve. Hello, Lynn. Thank you for watching. So this is our burdock. And again, if you want to make, make some really nice food, lovely one does take a lot of energy. And that's the thing with foraging. You need to decide, is it worth it? Are you going to actually create more work for yourself digging it up and processing it? Or will you get enough energy from that plant to make it worthwhile? And the one next to it is definitely the one I'd say is worthwhile. So in your garden, if you can leave some stinging nettles, you will always have a really good source of food for you and for wildlife. So this is the stinging nettle. Hopefully you know how to identify that. This time of year and over the last few weeks is the time to pick it. And I do have another YouTube video that tells you how to make stinging nettle soup. But it's these four top leaves that you want to harvest only. Those are going to be the nicest, the tenderest, and they actually also contain the highest amount of nitrates. So it's got a really good amount of vitamins and nutrients that you are be, you're usually craving after the winter famine, naturally, in our society. So you should be trying to aim for drink, eating some of these, and therefore you should be able to replace the nutrients you've missed out from your winter crops. So pick those up with gloved hands or without if you're brave enough and then you can have a nice you can put them in a spinach you can make a stew you can even make a tea now the reason they sting I doubt you can see this but see the tiny little hairs along there what you've actually got is a hair made out of silica which is glass tiny glass hair and attached to the end of that is a tiny little vessel it looks a bit like a vase and when you touch that hair the hair basically is like a hair trigger and the trigger moves away and that vessel breaks and it squirts that chemical into you. So that, that, that chemical that then goes into your, your hand is also going to make you, your, get, you get the sting and you get the irritation. Now they do say the best thing for a stinging nettle sting to get rid of it is a stinging nettle. But... It seems a bit counterintuitive to then go back to the same plant that stung you to pick it to then rub it on the sting. But they do say that that is the best thing. But there is one plant I will show you um, just as we go back this way, if I can find it. That's also a very good way of getting over stinging ethyl stings.
Okay, we're going to finish off with this one. Not naturally a wooden plant, I suppose, well, maybe. This is an apple tree. And a bit like the other trees we started with, of course, it's coming into blossom now. And not like the, the blackthorn, we don't get the blossoms first on the apple tree. We get the leaves coming out first, but then we get the blossoms afterwards. But again, if you want to do some really good pollinator watching, watch your, any of your blossoms and see if you can see any of those pollinators visiting. See what they're doing. And if you want to dissect these flowers, you can start to actually pull apart and find out where they're going. So any butterflies will have a nice long proboscis, which is their tongue, which is twirled up into a, concert, into a concentric circles. It then puts it down into the base of the anther there, down by the base of this, um, where the stigma is, and that's where your nectar is. They'll suck it up, and as they do that, they'll be pushing past these anther here, collecting pollen, and then going to another plant, and that pollen will then rub against the next one. So the different flowers will be at different times in their development. So you can see that one's pollen is all out because it's all purple. And then this one is a bit earlier on, the pollen's not quite ripe yet. So maybe the pollen from that flower will go onto the sticky stigma on the centre of that flower there. And then once that's pollinated, this pollen will then become ripe for it to pollinate another flower. And this stops them um, from pollinating themselves, so they get more variety and got much greater chance of being adapted to diseases. Because if you have the same plant pollinating itself, you start to reduce your gene pool and you start to have the same flowers and they're very susceptible to the same diseases in your garden that you'd like to share I can try and identify them for you I'm not very good at ornamentals but great for looking at um, the wild ones so thank you for joining me again keep posting keep up with my YouTube channel so you can see what's going on on our daily activities okay bye for now what did you say